Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened. You know, before we introduce our guest, Denise, I just wanted to tell our listeners that you and I had gotten this lovely message from a man who listened to the show, and he was sharing how hard it was to be a man and to also be an empath. And we kind of talked about this, and we set the intention to reach more men through the show. And what I find so fascinating is we've been teaching our mediumship class for years now, and we'll get like one guy who signs up. But this time, after setting that intention, we had three men sign up, and then you met our guest. So I just think it speaks to the power of setting intentions. Very much so. Ian Johnson lives in Portland, Maine, and currently works as a building sustainability consultant. In his work, he uses regenerative thinking to support the design of high-performance buildings and landscapes. He is passionate about earth healing and also teaches and practices permaculture and earth reconnection. Through meditation and spirituality, he is an empath and has utilized this gift to help others and the world around him. Currently, he is writing a book about being a male empath, which will be out later this year. This book looks to provide support to other male empaths who are struggling with embracing their empathy and finding their true self. And as a mother of a male empath, as a daughter of a male empath, this book is so long overdue. Um, so, Ian, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me both. So, one of the first things is I'm absolutely fascinated with your spiritual path because you're, you know, just, if you see Ian and you'll see a picture of him when I post it with the show, he's just a regular guy. And I don't mean that to, I'm not being gender biased, I'm not going down that road, but tell us a little bit about how you opened up to your spiritual path because I think that's fascinating as all out. Sure. Um, so it, you know, kind of started as, you know, growing up and uh, kind of getting, you know, getting the feeling that I, I, I felt different. I wasn't wanting to do all the things um, most of the guys my age were wanting to do. And, you know, even if I was, you know, hanging out or whatever, um, there was something else there. There's something kind of that, you know, pulled me a little bit away and said, pay attention to this. And when you're younger, that's often hard to do. All I wanted to do was blend in, look like everybody else, be interested in all those same things. And so as I kind of got older, I was, I had this, you know, kind of feeling and I said, oh, meditation, I'm going to be good at that. And I had never meditated before. I didn't know uh, how to do it. Um, and then as time progressed, I began the daily meditation practice. Um, I ended up traveling to India for three weeks for um, kind of a, a meditation retreat and silent meditation. Um, and we did some service projects over there. And, you know, I've continued with that. And then realizing kind of, you know, what an empath was, I kind of saw like, oh, this starts to fit together into who I am and more about what I wanted to do in the world. And it just kind of has progressed from there. What is your process of meditation? Whenever I hear about people meditating in India, I have this image like from Eat, Pray, Love of meditating for 10 hours on end. What, <laughs> like, what did that look like for you? Uh, so, yeah, so actually I did, you know, 10 hours a day for 10 days, uh, actually in Massachusetts a couple of months ago. But in India, it was um, through uh, the Art of Living organization. And so that is a, there's a technique, a, a breathing technique that you use, and then they tie that into um, a silent meditation as well, which kind of takes you much deeper. So it was four days of silent meditation with the breathing techniques before um, that process started. And so nowadays, I don't always do the breathing techniques. I will do some more simple kind of focused on breath. And I also practice uh, Sahaja Yoga which is, uh, you know, kind of just a free meditation that anyone can look up online and learn the technique. And that's really just focusing on, you know, the energy flow through your body and um, the energy at the top of your head. So very simple, very good place to start. My friend uh, who teaches that locally uh, introduced me to it. And so I was just lucky enough to work with him and get to know that. You know what I was just thinking about as you were speaking is that how many, the empathic men that I know need that nature time. And I'm thinking about my father was a lobsterman, and that was his favorite thing was to be out on the ocean. My son, who's very empathic, when he needs to recharge his batteries, he'll take off by himself and go into the woods. So the fact that you chose a profession that links being an empath and sustainability 
and then that opened up these doors for you. Do you find as a male empath you need that earth energy and that connection with nature more so than maybe some of your other colleagues and friends? Oh, con constantly, Denise. Uh, you know, I've realized that if I don't get it, I start not feeling 100%. And, you know, as busy as our lives are these days, you don't always get out into the woods when you want. And um, so making time to get out in nature and by myself, you know, it's nice to go on hikes and walks with others, but I've definitely noticed too that I don't get the same benefits if, um, you know, I'm having a conversation with someone while walking through. It's really, you know, it's kind of almost like the, uh, the car wash for me. It like cleans everything off and let, lets me uh, get back to zero. So definitely, and it, it definitely played a role in how I became a sustainability consultant and got into permaculture and trying to find ways to do edible forest gardening um, and, you know, not just, you know, improve the soil and improve the ecology, but also provide for human needs with, you know, food sources, which is what permaculture is all about. You just made a really good point about doing it alone. And when I was camping recently, there was a couple, there was a man that was in the campsite next to me, and he was talking about how few, we, we had a conversation about how few people can actually go off by themselves and take that time to recharge because they're not comfortable. They're either afraid or they don't want to be alone or, but as empaths and, and not to be gender biased, but I think especially as male empaths, that time alone is vital. Yeah, it, it really is. And it, it's funny because growing up, I didn't really have any time alone. You know, I have two very loud sisters and a loud mother and the house, <laughs> the house is very chaotic. Um, and so I didn't even know, you know, I had this real need because there just wasn't the opportunity very often. You know, I'd go off on my own here and there. But, you know, as I got older and kind of had more uh, free time, you know, the time spent alone in the woods was my peace and my recharge. And so I really see how important it is. And, you know, I ended up reading books on forest bathing, which is, you know, become very popular in Japan. Uh, so um, it's, just, it's just funny how you stumble on things as the need arises. Talk to us about that feeling of growing up in a house of women and feeling different and, and how you reconciled that in your, in your heart. Yeah, um, it, it took some time uh, to feel comfortable as a man and have, you know, deep empathy for others and for the planet. Because especially growing up in that household, I was definitely influenced by female energy, but yet I was still a man and wanted to feel that way and find ways to bring that into what I did and who I was. I, I think it's often, it's, it's hard to especially when you're younger, to say, I'm unique and I'm different and that's important. At least it was, it was very hard for me. Um, I really wanted to just be part of the, the crew and do all the same things. And so as I kind of learned what I needed, uh, which was you know time alone and more time spent in nature, med a meditation practice, I couldn't eat certain foods because I was sensitive to them. And so I couldn't just go out and, you know, eat whatever. I had to kind of be a little more, uh, more scheduled with things like that. It's helped me to become my, myself and, and be okay with that and, and, and love who I am, which for a long time was very difficult. And I think the, the process of growing up with the women in the home and going through struggles along the way you know, help me to evolve and to be comfortable in, in my own skin uh, and to say I'm a male empath and that's something that this world really needs right now. I agree. Yeah. Do you feel, so as a woman, I'm one of three girls and I am a mother of three girls. So I, I'm all about the female, but I don't know a lot about men other than what I've observed and, you know, learned being, being married to a man for 20 years. I feel like you guys have this unspoken pressure to be manly. Like, did you guys see Michael Jordan giving the lovely speech at Kobe Bryant's memorial? And he said, now nah, there's going to be another crying emoji about me. It's right. like men are being made fun of for showing emotion. Do, do men really feel that type of pressure or am I just making it bigger than it is? No, it's, it's definitely there. It's funny you bring that up. You know, I was watching a movie a couple of weeks ago 
uh, with Will Ferrell, and you know he was kind of the emotional one in the in the movie, and you know it was kind of the, it was the joke, and I said, oh, that's really it's everywhere. It's not allowed for men to be emotional or show their feelings, and I have very, I have very few male friends that I could you know really even talk to about this stuff. Most of my friends who I can speak with are women about empath and emotions and things like that, and so it's you know it's I feel so uh, strongly that, you know, we just need to talk about it more and to not make it just like a joke all the time. And with the shift of women in the world taking on such a more stronger and leading role that's so important, I just kept thinking, well, if they're going to come into their place where they need to be to help this world heal, the men really need to come into their role with the empath side. You know, the women already have that. And so, you know, kind of finding that whole balance in the world is really important. That's, you're so spot on with that. One of my sons hit middle school and shut everything down because mm-hmm. kids can be cruel. And if you're not following, he was very emotional prior to that and then shut it all off because of the cultural and societal norms of being in a small town in New England. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't show any emotions. And, you know, I was thinking about it in retrospect and it can manifest for a lot of and I think right now it can manifest for a lot of people but especially young men in depression or anxiety or feeling unsure of what their path is supposed to be and they'll jump from one thing to another because they haven't been able to identify with that inner emotional connection with themselves. Yeah, I, I really feel that. That's a great point. It's like you can't even get at who you are because you keep suppressing a huge part of it. Right. Um, and you're, you're, just, you're trying to let yourself out and you know society and your friends are pushing you in a totally different direction. So it's, it, it takes some time to get to the point where you're able to really focus on that and, and let it out. And I, I often say, you know, true comfort comes from discomfort because the way I got there was from really tough times and struggling with life and, you know, trying to find myself. And, but through all that, it was like the doors opened and I was like, oh, you know, here I am and here are things I care about and I want to pursue. And now it allows you to share that with this generation coming up who need this desperately. They desperately need this, this group of kids coming in. We're changing the rules and no one has given them a handbook. Right. Exactly. I wish I had a handbook of how to handle things, mm-hmm. um, especially while younger. There's so many pressures and there's you know so much bullying that's in the news and um, it's becoming such an issue that giving young people ways to really accept who they are and f- somehow let go of the pressures of you know your your friend group and what's in the media and on social media and all of that, it's difficult to do. But it's really, it's important to the next generation and to getting the world where we really would like, like it to be. Also very much about wi- women in relationship, in romantic relationships, can show their emotions, they can feel everything deeply, they can suck it all up like a sponge, and again, more socially acceptable. But when men feel that same depth, I don't think people truly understand. And what I'm thinking of is a conversation I had with a a very empathic young man and said my whole life, uh, uh, I've been told I'm too nice and that's why my relationships don't work. And I said, there's no such thing as too nice. But from a male perspective, how do you feel about that that too nice moniker? Oh, I've heard it as well. (laughs) I, I... I'll never forget the time I really heard it. I was sitting down with a, a friend at the bar and we were talking about, you know, just relationships with women. And he said, Ian, you're just too nice. You have to be meaner. And, you know, I sat there and I thought about it and it's like, okay, maybe he's right. You know, I'm, I was at the time I was probably like 30 years old and still, you know, hadn't had a long, real long relationship. And I said, well, maybe there's something to that. And then I stopped and I said, if I have to be someone other than myself to be in a relationship, I'd rather be on my own. Oh, I love that. And, you know, that's kind of how I've I've lived since. And, you know, I 
it's, it's a struggle to be, I think, in a healthy relationship for one, for anyone. And then there's, you know, an, an added level when you're an empath, I think, because one, most women's expectations are that, you know, you're going to behave like every other man and you're not going to show emotion. And although often it's talked about, oh, I'd love to have a guy that, you know, had emotion and awareness, I think, for certain things, it's, it's like when you show it, it, it almost seems like, oh, I just gave up a card and mm-hmm. uh, that's not what they were looking for. So, and, and, you know, and that's another struggle is, oh, I'm not getting the relationship that I would like because of who I am. Am I not being who I'm supposed to be? You know, and then you start questioning it. But I, I think for people, it's really about just em- embracing who they are, being comfortable with it, which takes time. Like you said, Denise, there's, there's no too nice. You have, to, you have to just be you. Having that strength to say, I'd rather be alone than fake it to make it in a relationship. I think that's key. That's key. And it's, it's hard, right? You know, yeah. um, everyone wants to kind of have their person and to be comfortable with that. Sometimes we're expected to have that, whether we want it or not. I think that's also part about going out into the woods alone. It's kind of a similar, similar feeling. I'd rather have that ability to be on my own and not have the, the weight of trying to pretend to be someone else just to be in a relationship. Or it's the same for if you, you know, have a job you don't like or something, you just pretend to kind of maintain because what you really want to do is, is not acceptable to your parents or to society. But finding a partner, whether you're a male or a female empath, who can actually understand that the time alone isn't that you don't love them or care for them or respect them. You just need that time, that autonomy and independence to recharge so that you can be more present in a relationship. Right. And that's tough. That's it's, really tough. It's tough. And it's tough to figure out what that looks like um, mm-hmm. because it's often not like the societal norm. Right? right for people to find what's comfortable for them and to somehow make that work might take a little time and a little trial and error and really good communication really good communication which which is difficult to be open and not be worried about what someone else might think if you say how you're feeling yeah it 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 takes time and and, and effort <laughs> just like anything okay i don't want to throw your ass under the bus but <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> If beep, like, beep, here comes the bus. <laughs> <laughs> for a lot of female empaths, we tend to have to have, maybe have a propensity to attract a more narcissistic type partner. Have you found that same issue as a male empath attracting women who may not be as supportive and encouraging? And uh, time and time again, <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I, uh, it, as you know. You don't realize it at first, but then you look back at past relationships and go, I did it again. I did mm-hmm. it again. And you see the similarities throughout past relationships. And absolutely, I have to say, although that's really difficult to deal with, and one of the situations was really, really difficult. And it tested me on so many levels. And trying to be who I was, which was empathetic and trying to help her in difficulty she was having, but then realizing that there was nothing coming back my way um, was really, it was like opening the door for me to realize you need this and you need this in a relationship or else you can't be in one. And this is not working. Having that really difficult trial really opened my eyes to that that was even something that would happen. You know, before then I wasn't really aware that, oh, you know, someone's really might be taking advantage of your wanting to give and to support, it was hard to, it's hard to like swallow that pill because you're like, no, but I want this relationship. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, going through a lot of those kind of many relationships over and over again, it finally opened my eyes. (laughs) You know what helped me with that was studying Reiki. Because for years I would kind of brag that I was like the perfect girlfriend because I'm not needy. I'm not naggy. If you want to go off for a weekend or a vacation, I don't care because I'm going to do the same thing. And I was like, gosh, you know, it's pretty easy to be with me. And then I took Reiki and they they emphasize so much what you just said, that there has to be an exchange of energy with everything. 
So like they were always say like, you don't have to charge money for Reiki, but there has to be an equal exchange of energy. And I took that home with me and I thought, huh, it helped me with all my relationships because I started looking at friendships and personal relationships and thinking, where's the equality here? But I think as empaths, we don't recognize that because we're so comfortable giving. It's what we want to do. It's what we're here to do that when we don't get something in return, we're like, I'm good. That's fine. I'm self-contained. Right. Yeah, we're, we're able to kind of be okay with that for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> I think until it catches up with us, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Now, some of the men I've been talking to, because I love to just kind of sit back and observe culture and the way it's changing. And my dad being in advertising for years, he would always teach me to look at commercials. And he would say, if you want to learn anything about what's happening in society, study that country's commercials. And I was talking to some of my men friends about how in commercials nowadays, men are like the idiots. Mm. You know, like, oh, they don't know how to do laundry, poor guy. Or, you know, they don't know how to clean a house. Oh, I got to teach them with Clorox. And if you, if you look at it, I feel like men don't really know right now what their role is. They're not being asked to be the sole provider. They're not being asked to be the manly man necessarily. And so I think a lot of men are struggling with, what does it mean to be a man? Right. Have, have you felt that as well? Absolutely. It's, it's trying to find your place. And people, would, it's like we've been in a, a, a man's world for so long. And as this shift happens, it, it's, it's uprooting that. And there's some stumbling that's going to happen. Like you said, the media doesn't support evolving men in the right direction. And so I th it's, it's kind of about trying to find our place in this world. And, you know, that's why I think there's good opportunities to really follow your, your path and go off the beaten path a little bit and try and figure out what's important to you as a, as a man so that you don't have to just be the kind of the stumbling uh, idiot that's trying to figure out, you know, how to do the dishes, <laughs> but actually find your passion in life and, and pursue it. Well, here's self-care, how to take care of yourself. And from what you've said, finding your own inner truth and knowing and using that as your compass, mm -hmm. making sure you get time out in nature, setting boundaries with people. What would be some other things that you consider paramount as an empathic male to take care of yourself? Yeah, uh, def definitely getting outside at least some point daily as much, for as long as you can. Eating good foods as I've kind of progressed with meditation and, you know, realized I'm an empath, uh, I've become more sensitive to different foods or poor quality foods. Uh, so that's been really important. Um, and I start to, you know, notice which things can make me feel pretty awful. Making sure you have enough time to yourself, I think, is just key. With my work that I've been doing in sustainability, you know, I was on some nonprofit boards and signed up to help people after work a lot of the time. And that kind of started to weigh on me and it was a lot of a lot to handle and you know you just keep saying yes to things as an empath and then you know six months to a year later your free time is completely taken up so i think really it's okay to say no or i've done this for long enough i've had to step back from a lot of things and it feels a lot better to do that and i feel healthier even just letting go sometimes do you have any advice for women who are in relationships with men who aren't empaths or might be empaths who have learned to kind of tamp it down? You know, I think a lot of men do that. They might show empathic traits and then they're kind of ridiculed for it. Like my, my dad is an empath and he never liked sports. I didn't even know what the Super Bowl was until I started <laughs> dating because it just wasn't a part of our upbringing at all. And and he was always made fun of that. And he just kind of learned to tamp it down. And at night he'd read poetry, and he, but he would never share any of that with his men friends. Mm. So do you have any advice for women listening to this who are trying to get to the heart of their partner, but they can't break through that, that cultural barrier that they've erected for protection? Yeah, I, I would you know, really suggest that they just try and let them know it's okay, at least around them. Uh, at home that they can be themselves and to do the things that they really enjoy 
and talk about the things they want to talk about. Even for me, you adjust. You have your kind of your your layer of what you talk about and uh, your conversations that you discuss with your you know buddies who want to watch football and people at work. And so I think at home that should definitely be a safe place. So women should be really good at being able to give the guys a place that's comfortable for them and say, hey, you can have your your time alone uh, when you need it and just talk about it. It's I think often that. Think it's it makes things harder when we just kind of pretend it's not there and we don't have have the communication. Yeah, I have also found that when men are distracted, they tend to open up more. Mm-hmm. So, like if you went for a jog or played tennis or did some golf, and then ask the deeper questions, I have better experiences trying to get like a closed off man to open up if they're distracted doing something physical. Yeah, and uh, one of the things I would add too to the you know the list of things to keep a keep yourself um in check is is lots of good exercise things build up in our bodies and so getting out and and moving or reading a book you've been meaning to read and just doing something that really fills your your cut back up uh, i think i think you're right it definitely helps to you know get get more grounded um and feel comfortable opening up for sure another common thread and i don't know if this might be too wide of a blanket statement is a lot of empathic men that I've met and know personally have a very creative side. And if they don't honor that creativity, that can hinder their emotional flow as well. So whether it's writing or painting or gardening or whatever that might be, it seems like there needs to be some kind of a creative outlet for all of us as empaths, but even more so for male empaths at times. Right. Well, and I think because there's not always the the easy kind of choice in picking something like that for a man. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there might not, you know, there's not usually a group of guys that will go and, you know, paint together or something right. like that. But you could play music or you could, what's another thing, photography or mm-hmm. something that's more culturally acceptable as being equally for male. Right. Yeah, and I, the, there's definitely a creative component to being an empath for sure, right? Um, it's figuring out what what's yours and what fills your cup up, what makes you feel good. It's like so many things we do throughout the day can be stressors, and it's like we have to go do it. It's part of life. But if you have the you know one or two things that fills you back up, that's key. Getting into the garden or getting outside and listening to music or playing music. I think it's like a candle flame. You know how one light can light others. I think that you coming out and talking about this can light other candle flames for men because I do think there's a need and a desire for this. I mean, I was listening to the radio on Valentine's Day as I was driving to drop my kids off at school. And the the DJ guy said, so yesterday was Valentine's Day. And I guess that's when girls get together and they celebrate their friendship love for each other. And he kind of laughed nervously. And he said, why don't guys do this? I mean, maybe I should start Palentine's Day. (laughs) And all the other guys on the radio show just laughed and laughed. But I thought, you know, I bet guys would kind of enjoy something like me. We wouldn't call it Palentine's Day, but <laughs> no, no, that's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. But wouldn't it be great if there were more situations? Because you're right. Like at least three times a year, my friends and I will go paint at the mm. at the painting place, or we'll go and throw pottery, or we'll like on Sunday, I'm going to do yoga. I can't see a man going, "Hey, painting with a twist is having a really good <laughs> Friday night." <laughs> But I think that it can start with small things, like instead of just getting together to, you know, play hoops, you could just have a glass of beer together and talk. Right. Yeah. And I mean, it's funny, that's even become difficult for me because I've become allergic to alcohol. And so that that's created another boundary between typical guy friends. I can't even go have a beer now, but I'll go sit and have a seltzer and it's totally fine. And so I don't know if other men out there have become allergic um, as well through like meditation. They say can, you know, if you meditate quite a bit, it can bring up the things that you're allergic to. But, you know, that kind of has removed me from that a little bit, but it is finding like anything um, to just go out and, and hang out. And there's not, there's, there's, it seems like there's fewer things for guys to just get together and go do. Even, you know, my close friends, we 
kind of struggle to find things to actually go and hang out and schedule to go have time together. So often it's, you know, you know, a camping trip or something like that, that's kind of a little more scheduled and out of town. But those kind of quick, quick encounters and are a little more difficult. Like, do guys ever just talk on the phone? Like, no. like no, that doesn't happen. Like you, like when you call a friend, it's always for a reason. It's not just to say, hey, thinking about you, how you doing? Yeah, very, very rarely. You know, it would be, it would probably be a, a call like that if um, there was a big event, like they had a baby or they got married or they're go, you know, just got back from a big trip. Maybe you just check in. Wow. But, yeah, very rarely would I talk on the phone for more than you know five or ten minutes. <laughs> We're what about like if I have like if I had a bad day at work or a bunch of students were giving me a hard time I would have to talk it through with at least two friends mm. do you guys do that uh no no, <laughs> no I, I, I I'm I'm usually talking to uh I have a couple friends that I can talk but it, you know I'd probably go meet them in person if it was really bad but yeah yeah rarely have but I you had. wouldn't like pick up the phone on the way home and be like John I just got to tell you about this shit day I just had um, not with my friends, no. I've yeah. I've never I've never done that. I mean, see, I've never known a man to do that either. Yeah. What about like? Um, sometimes I'll read a book or I'll see a movie, and it just really impacts me on a heart level, and I'll have to call someone and talk about it. Nope. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, and and I but but I think we all, we still think about that stuff. It's just you just it like comes into your head and you push it away. Okay, and just, I'm going to, this is, goes back to what you said about having a safe home environment. If you're watching that movie at home on the couch with your family or people that you love, and you're a male empath, and you tear up, and you feel it that deeply, and you feel safe enough to express that, that's huge. That is so, so huge to have that safe place to express it, or to do it alone. Equally, though, it's interesting if uh, my my sons will call and they won't talk. They I don't think they know how to form words if they're going to call their friends. They'll text or they'll send a group message or something, mm -hmm. but they'll call and check in with me and they'll say, just thought I'd call, see how you're doing, is everything's okay? And because they know that's important to me. And I think that's their empathic thing is, okay, she needs to hear my voice to know I'm all right. Right. So right. I think that that's kind of that parameter, but you're playing the male roles. Now I'm going to say this and Please, anyone who's listening, I don't, this is not a personal attack. My own opinion, something I've experienced on a personal level, I think the hardest thing to be on the planet right now is a young, sensitive, creative, intelligent, empathic male. And please don't tear me a new one over that one, but I've seen it over and over again. And I think we need to rewrite the tape a little bit and what Ian is offering us in this show and with the book that he's writing is some ways that we can open that door for these younger men that are coming in who need some guidance. They're, they're good guys. They just don't know how to navigate this. Yeah. And, you know, Denise, I think it's a good point because there's, there's so few role models for, Thank for, you. Ma for male empaths. You know, I was trying to think of, as I'm writing the book, I want to talk a little bit about who are the, who are our role models right now. And, you know, it's like, I think of like the Dalai Lama, you know, it's like, here's, here's a man, he's not a typical man, but he's strong in so many ways, but there's very few um, men to look up to. And Mr. To, Rogers. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> exactly. Mr. Rogers. And, you know, a lot of us grew up with him and th I mean, you could probably count on one hand, right? Yes. You know, and that's so important. And so it's like you, you hope that, you know, you might have at least a family member that you could talk to, but you might not, they might not be the person who's like the role model or like an empathetic role model. Well, we're promoting strong, independent women, which I think we should. I think we equally need to promote strong, empathic men. I definitely I, agree. Because it's all about balance. I, exactly. Yeah, it's all about balance. And so strong, confident women kind of evolve, the, the men need to evolve with that. And that's really the piece of this that I see. It's like, it's completing the circle of, you know, kind of the yin yang balance, trying to make it all one so we can all work for a better world. Where communication comes in. I think that men and women need to learn how to really talk to each other. 
my sister has boys. And I remember when they were in high school, she and I would have these long talks. Ian, that's when you sit at a table. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have these long talks because when her, one of her sons went through his first breakup, he cried about it. He mourned it. He was really upset. And I remember she said to me, did, did you ever think like when we were dating in high school and college that when it ended that the, that the guys went through heartache? And I said, no, I just thought they kind of moved on. Mm. And it, just watching her sons grow up, we both realized, obviously we know men, but we don't know men. Right. So I think that communication piece is so important. I don't know how to get there, but hopefully people like you stepping up is going to help us. Yeah. And, you know, for me, it's, it's, I've had to like, be conscious about communicating. I think it's definitely harder for most men to communicate and open up. And you really have to be kind of focused on, okay, this is something I have to do. And I'm going to have to try a little bit at a time to really work at it. Because it doesn't, it, for, for most of us, it doesn't come naturally. And it, it doesn't feel safe in a lot of places. So having friends and people that you know who can allow you to have, feel like you have a safe space to be yourself and open up, that's really key. And so if, peop, you know, if you're around people who aren't letting you do that, then it's probably time to let them go. I agree. Do you buy into some of the cultural hangups? Like, for example, with my former husband, we had, you know, Rottweilers and Dobermans and Weimariners, and then these two little Yorkies kind of mm. stumbled into our life. He would not walk those Yorkies without me <laughs> because he felt like an idiot with these two little dogs. Of course, Lily does have like a pink bow around her neck, so... I wanted to paint the dining room like a salmon color, which is not pink. And he was like, no, that's, I'm not doing that. Like little things like that. Would, I wanted to get a station wagon. No, I cannot be seen driving a station wagon. Do you have hangups like that? Or is, or is that not something you ever bought into? I think probably because how I was raised, uh, I've driven a station wagon for most of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I also grew up with Yorkies that I had to walk. Uh, Alone? <laughs> Uh, yeah, as a kid, you know, my mom always had Yorkies growing up. So I guess it was, I would definitely think about it. Uh, I would definitely be like, okay, I'm a, I'm a guy walking a, a little Yorkshire Terrier right now. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd feel the pressure, I guess, from like society, but I didn't really worry about it as much because it was just the way things were. But yeah, I mean, some of those, like, I think a lot of what you're talking about there is kind of what pushes men to keep it all in and not talk openly, not be themselves in a lot of scenarios, because there are li things like that kind of all around, you know, whether it's like wearing a certain shirt color or, you know, walking the, the little dogs. Like we said earlier, it's like there's this, you know, unwritten, unsaid thing that men are manly and you, you got to kind of be a, a jerk. I don't even know, the, I can't find the right word, but. No, but that's, that's a toughness. really, yeah. And that's a really, really good point because none of what you're saying is about losing your masculinity or your maleness or your being a, a strong man. It's none of that has to do with being a male empath right. at all. And I think that's where people get hung up that if a man expresses his emotions or feels things deeply, or is that connected to the pulse of the earth that somehow it makes him not as much of a man, but in reality, it allows you to navigate the world in a way that most men can't. Right, right. Yeah, I and mean, there's the, you know, the feeling that we're supposed to, you know, puff ourselves up and, you know, act like this, like, big, strong guy all the time. And, you know, you feel that pressure to do that. And in reality, it's like, no, you just, you, you can still be strong. You can still be confident. Yes. Uh, without kind of that like bravado yeah exactly i'm still hung up on you guys having a bad day and not talking about it like what do you <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with those thoughts and that frustration and how do you figure out okay what's my strategy going to be with the cranky boss tomorrow like do you just process it all internally or do you just push it away yeah, I, I, I guess it depends, but definitely get it out through exercise. And then, you know, if, if you have a wife or a girlfriend, that's at least someone you could probably talk to a bit. Yeah, there's, it's, I, think, I think a lot of it's kept in. There's, it's, it's rare that you have the, 
the good other male friends to really talk to who aren't just going to say, Oh, that, that, that sucks. You know, it's like you, you, I think you really want someone who's going to be a little em- empathetic to you and under- be a little understanding to what's going on and not just have uh, a one word answer. Yeah. And just hold space with you through that. Exactly. Which is where I think journaling can help a lot of empathic men. Cause at least you can get it out there. Right. You know, if a man likes to, you know, if, if you're a writer, I think that can be a really important thing. And I'm sure meditating has often helped you with that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've jur- journaled a little bit. The, the meditation though has definitely probably been number one in just clearing things out of, of your head that you've been focusing on or kind of perseverating on for a while. And it's key to have something like that as an outlet, like you said, for sure. So before we wrap up, Ian, can you just tell us a little bit about your work in sustainability and what that looks like and give us some hope about where that field is going? Absolutely. So I've been, uh, I guess, the last 10 years uh, working primarily in building sustainability. So for buildings, homes, commercial buildings, uh, large apartment buildings, and focusing on building certifications, uh, which kind of set standards for energy efficiency and water use and building material health. And so, uh, you know, a lot is being paid attention to in how we build the buildings that we live in. And some studies were done that showed we spend 90% of our lives inside, which is really a sad fact. But the good news is, is that a lot of new technologies are coming out and a lot of new focus and incentives is putting pressure to build things better. And in addition to that, I've also been really into the earth and soil health because it's all tied together. And so I've also focused a lot on permaculture, which includes rather than having the typical um, landscape that many people have, which would be, you know, a turf yard with, you know, your standard grass that you have to mow and water and you um, have to buy gas for the lawnmower and you have to put pesticides on so pests don't come and you need to put fertilizer. You can actually create something that gives you uh, outputs with less inputs. So instead of putting all those things into the grass, you can, you know, plant a lot of perennial vegetables and fruit trees and fruit bushes and um, herbs and things that can uh, grow and create an ecosystem for the, the natural wildlife, but also give you herbal supplements and fruit and vegetables um, throughout the year. And it helps to build soil health rather than kill microbes in the soil. And that's, you know, a big issue too, is, you know, soil health around the world. Wow, that's really wonderful. I think it's so amazing to have a job where you can come home at the end of the day and say my work is literally helping people yeah i I don't know if i'd be able to do it's it's hard to you know do something that isn't giving back i wouldn't say that always the work i'm doing at work is giving back but to have some level of i'm trying at least trying to make the world a little bit better i don't think i could go to work every day if i wasn't didn't even have a little bit of that so thank you it's wonderful when do you think your book will be done? Uh, I'm hoping for sometime this year. I hope to wrap it up in the next couple months and then um, be looking for a publisher and to get that all processed and put it out there as soon as I can. Well, you'll have to come back on the show when you get it out to the world. I would love to. Thank you very much, Ian, for sharing this with us. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you both for having me. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed it too. And we will post links and more information about Ian on our Facebook page so you can check him out and look to have him back when his book has been birthed into the world. Thank you guys so much for listening. As always, don't forget to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.